when I create content, I I personally think about novelty a lot. Like that's sort of my mental model for, is this idea good? Like, is this novel in some way? I'm gonna start. Uh, our guest today is a force in the marketing and audience research world. Uh, she's the first, first and foremost, a great chef that graduated from Le Cordon Bleu. And I'm sure you're, you're still cooking all the time, still a big part of what you do. But since then, you've also added on this massively successful career in content growth and marketing. So really a, a double whammy in, in your career. Lots of lots of flexibility there. You're also the, the VP of marketing at Spark Toro. You host a lot of YouTube shows, do a lot of podcasts. I'm thankful you came onto this one and you are absolutely crushing it on social media across the board. So today we welcome in Amanda Natividad. Welcome in. Let's this is the awkward part where we pretend like we haven't been talking for 15 minutes before this. <laughs> All right, and then the audience is clapping. Yeah, right? we're clapping. That's how that, we're we're going to add that in in post production, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, so Amanda and I, and I have known each other for a little while, uh, talked a couple times, and this is going to be a good one. So turn the volume up. We're we're going to dive into audience research here. Before we get too much into that, this is a content creation podcast first and foremost, and you are a content creator, a prolific one at that. So Let's talk origin story. Before you got good at it, you're good at it now. That couldn't have always been the case. What was the first time where you remember thinking about, oh, I should probably start creating content? Oh my gosh. You know, I, I think I've kind of, content creation has always kind of been part of my life. Um, I started writing short stories in fourth grade or in kindergarten and then in fourth grade. I wrote like a short one in kindergarten about animal crackers coming to life and chasing me. And then in fourth grade, I wrote a short story about leprechauns. Don't know why. Um, and then, oh, by junior high, by sixth grade or so, I, you know, I think I, think I invented email newsletters because I had a, a weekly newsletter. It was, it was about a fictional band, like musical band. And it was really just an excuse to send e-bombs world memes to my classmates. So it used to just be like a wave file that was like, hey, the new single just dropped. And then goofy photos. And I'd say like, oh, new photo shoot we just did. Check out the bands, do headshots. Um, and just really silly stuff like that. So I've kind of always done it in very small uh, kind of personal ways. And really truly doing it at scale as a marketer didn't come until, you know, my career pivot from journalism into content marketing. <laughs> I forgot to mention there's there's this whole journalism thing in the middle there. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I also was a content creator earlier on, but also an ideas man. And I came up with the idea for the inside out Reese's peanut butter cup when I was eight years old. And they stole that from me a couple years later. So that was pretty devastating. I know, I know you're Did you pain. make it at home? Like, did you put it? I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out super well. <laughs> um, so this this journey that you've been on, now you're, you're talking, working at a company, really focusing heavily on content as one of your core channels, and content for you personally has been a massive thing. Maybe you could walk us through some, some of your key learnings there, and maybe some of the things you see people doing content creation-wise that are just awful, that we really should be avoiding. I always say like, I think it's really important to start out with, to basically identify three channels or so for yourself. Identify one top of funnel channel, ideally something in social media because your top of funnel channel should be where, where your audience or where the people already are. So focus on that. Have an owned home. Usually it's your blog or your personal site. Uh, Maybe it's a podcast, right? Maybe if your main content format is um, is audio and it's a podcast, maybe that's the home that you create. And the third one is figure out some kind of nurture stream, which would be like an email newsletter. I think those are the three core things to have. And I think what I see people do wrong is, I think depending on the type of person, right? Like I think we have a lot of great, there are a lot of writers who might take sort of a purist type of approach to their own work where 
they kind of see it as, no, I just want to have my, my sub stack or just my blog. Like that's what I publish on. That's my writing. That's my baby. And that makes sense to me. And, you know, but if there's no focus on top of funnel work on the social media aspect, then you're not actually growing your reader base, right? Because especially if you're a personal essayist, there's probably not a whole lot you can do with regards to an SEO driven strategy, right? Because if you're a personal essayist, things that you're writing about are probably things like why I decided to have children or, you know, um, what it means to me to have bought a home, like things like that, that people probably, the broader public probably isn't really Googling for. Um, and so that's where I, that's where I say you need to have a top of funnel channel so that you can eventually funnel people over to your own home. I love it. I love the approach. Maybe we're getting too far ahead of ourselves too. Cause that's like in itself, cool content strategy. Just run with that. If you're listening to this, just run with that content strategy. Uh, but there, there are obviously, there's a lot that goes into this beforehand and we even overthink it a lot, especially on the audience side, which is where I want to focus a ton of our, our thoughts today. You work for a company that specializes in audience research. So you probably have some good insights on this stuff, both with the tool and just your, your own experience, but starting with more of the brainstorming side. So if I'm going through this for the first time and I kind of know a main topic that I want to talk about, but I don't actually have my audience narrowed in. I would love to start diving deep in, into that a little bit. So within that brainstorming for the right audience, starting from scratch, are there common mistakes that you're seeing people making right off the bat when they're deciding or picking an audience? Okay. So there's an example that I can, I can, I can actually, um, I can elucidate on, but maybe to set that up, I would say a common mistake I see people make is sort of making the wrong conclusions about the data that they're seeing. So um, it might just be in the form of assuming that what works for one audience will work for another or drawing the wrong conclusions based on not seeing success. So the example that I have is we had a customer right into us at SparkToro and they had a food product um, and their food product was uh, a specialized food product and they got a placement in a food in a Japanese recipe food blog a uh, Japanese recipe blog so they got the placement there and I think that I think the blogger maybe did a recipe using their product whatever it was nice post drove amazing results for them and they were like great we, we know our audience. People love Japanese recipes. They love our product. We're going to target, you know, other people who like Japanese cooking. And then they tried doing that with their Facebook ads, retargeting people who went to like various Japanese food websites, people who showed affinity in Japanese food or cooking. Um, and they weren't seeing, they weren't seeing great conversion off their product. And so they wrote into us and they were like, what's, what's the problem here? Like, what, what, where do we go wrong? Like, I thought that everyone liked, I thought people who like Japanese food liked our product, which I thought was really, I think this is a really interesting example because their conclusion is fair, right? Sponsored a Japanese food blog, think they're going to target a Japanese food audience. However, uh, and this is sort of, sort of, I don't, you know what? It's not from knowing the food space because, or maybe it is. Uh, sorry, I'm like fighting with myself. Um, so I looked at it and realized, you know, no, I don't, I don't think, I think, I think you set up the targeting incorrectly. Like you, you're targeting Japanese food. The people who bought your product based on this blog post, they didn't buy it because they thought, I love Japanese food. Now I'm going to buy this random food item. And the item itself is not Japanese. These people converted because they saw, oh, I love this blogger. She makes amazing food. I really trust her style. I trust her taste in recipes. I trust her taste in food. Therefore, I'm going to buy this product. So those are two different intents. It wasn't, I love Japanese food, so I'm buying this thing. It's, I trust her expertise, so I'm going to buy this thing. So from that, I suggested, how about you consider looking up other food bloggers in this space who serve different niches. So then I brought up things like um, a more health-focused recipe blog and was like, here's an opportunity to, to target people who are thinking about healthy eating. 
um, and then suggested figuring out how they target or segment their audience kind of based on certain types of personas. So it might be like healthy food, might be gourmands. So that first food blog example. Um, and the third one I had, I think, was just like fitness enthusiasts. That was like, maybe there are people who aren't really foodies, but they're really into fitness and your food item fits into their lifestyle. So that's sort of an example that is like a real example in action that I think reflects a common mistake people have in audience research. When you personally have have some kind of new idea, whether you're building something out for yourself or for SparkTo or whatever, and you know it's kind of its own thing a little bit, so you know there, you've got to do a lot of research around this. Do you tend to find yourself worrying more about the topic first or the idea first, or do you dive into audience first, figure out the topic later? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's kind of a mix of both because sometimes, you know, sometimes you're just inspired by a certain idea that just popped into your brain and you're like, I got to I got to run with this. And then you go with that and then maybe afterwards kind of find the audience for it. That happens too. But then there are other times where, you know, you have the audience, you got to grind, you got to make the content happen. And so that's where I find it really helpful to like dig in, to dig into tools like Sparktoro to figure out what's top of mind for my audience and then figure out from there like, oh, People are talking a lot about email marketing. Maybe I should write something about setting up, you know, some kind of automation or like what type of nurture sequence to consider. Or then I was even just thinking like, oh, is there one that I should just actually set up for myself for my own nurture streams? But yeah. Got it. Yeah, I, I like that. I'm curious to, to learn more about, like dig deeper into your mental models, your filters that you use. I don't know if you have any strict mental models around this, but maybe filters you use to know if an idea first off is just worth going with to begin with but also if an audience is if, if the research you've done on an audience seems like it's going to click and it's worth expanding on it's worth going down that rabbit hole do you have any indicators for when you know you've hit on an audience that's probably worth looking into a little bit more yeah so i when i create content i I personally think about novelty a lot. Like that's sort of my mental model for is this idea good? Like is this novel in some way? And novel can be like it can be brand new information. Like maybe it's research I did or like sharing um, a key result. Like that that's brand new to someone. Um, or it might be um, uncovering a new truth like – something that goes that goes against the grain of what we were already what we were all taught there's that or there's even just a different way of phrasing something that might exist already like for example I did a I did a blog post called per, uh, the case for permissionless co-marketing but part of what I brought up was this concept of shouting out other people linking to their content without asking for anything in return that's not actually new. And like I very much say that in the blog post. Like it's it's not a new thing. I didn't invent this. But if you think about it like permissionless co-marketing, you can start to think about how people can be your collaborators without you really having to ask for it, right? If you kind of have a give first approach, you can sort of have these sort of unofficial informal partners and then um, sort of reap the res reap the benefits from that later on. Um, so I think a lot about novelty and one, as a marketer who marketer who markets to other marketers, um, it's a little bit easier for me to tap into novelty because it's a space I know really well. But, you know, sometimes it happens where I have an idea where I think like, oh, this is so great. This is a great idea. Surely no one has thought of this. Then I'll, I'll try to look it up, right? I'll, I'll look for things like, did, um, did other creators on Twitter – like in my niche, did they write about this? And then I'll kind of like do a search. Um, Cause I have, I follow people, put them on lists and stuff. Um, I'll look through, I'm like, okay, they didn't say that recently. So maybe I didn't, I didn't accidentally steal that idea. Um, or I'll look at some of the top marketing blogs and see if they wrote about it recently. And then if, if the answer is no to both of those things, then I feel more confident that I have a pretty novel idea. So there is some of that manual research aspect to it, but you know, it isn't, a ton of time spent doing that. I love that you brought up novelty as a core principle here because I want to touch on differentiation and novelty a little bit further down because that's a huge part of all of marketing and 
obviously having an audience that's differentiated as well as an idea. Those are, I guess those are two separate things, having a novel audience and having a novel idea. They're a little bit different. Um, yeah. What, what does a novel audience look like? That's a great question. I think a novel audience, to me, that is an audience that is new to a given topic. So something that I think about a lot is, well, so there's a free full query in SparkToro. I believe it is my audience uses these words in their profile, nutritionist. Uh, and if you have a SparkToro account, whether it's free or paid, it's going to be in your dashboard and you can see it there. But something I think about a lot is nutritionists. We all know what that is. Great. Um, in the demographics of these nutritionists or in this query, um, it shows that their other interests are public speaking and social media. So to me, this is a novel audience for the topics of how to become a better public speaker, right? If you take just the topic of becoming a better public speaker, that's not new, right? That's not novel. But this audience, it might be novel to them to see some, to read some insights like how to use evidence-based research on the fly in your public speaking opportunities. Like that's super interesting, I think. <laughs> um, and something that they might be looking for because one, they are nutritionists. They are, you know, they're, most of them are, pro most of them are probably registered dietitians. So evidence-based research, that's not new to them. Public speaking, a little bit newer to them. Blend the two and then maybe that becomes a nice little recipe for something that is new and novel to that audience. That's, I mean, that's, that's one way that I come up with content ideas too, is like, how can I, so I, I talk about marketing all the time that can become super boring if you don't mix it up. So how can I look at what people are tweeting about in gardening and then use formats from that and apply that to marketing? So it sounds like you're kind of applying a strategy like that to audience research, which is super interesting and kind of begs the question to one of the biggest questions that people have about building an audience or researching an audience, which is niching down. That's the common advice is, all right, take your general thing, niche down. Sometimes that looks like combining two different elements like you've mentioned. Sometimes it means going hyper-specific. But how, how deep do you think, if I'm just starting with a new idea, um, let's say it's a, a totally new product even, so it's not something within SparkTor or anything. It's totally net new idea for a company or something, and I'm researching the audience. How niche down really should I be looking to go at, up front, at least, to start validating this idea? Yeah, um, I would. I would think about how how specific can you get with maybe the target audience's title. Like, are you looking to reach out to you know junior level product managers, or is it more senior level product managers who? work closely with engineering teams or are in an engineering team proper, but work with, work with other teams. Like I would be thinking about that. Um, but I would also be thinking about one thing that's also tough with in the example of creating a new category is one, I do think you need to get super specific with who you're targeting so that you can speak their language, get on their level, um, and hopefully right over time, build relationships and get them to become advocates of your product. But on the other side of that, I think there's a challenge of overall awareness where, okay, you're creating a new category in something tech related, right? I just threw out product managers as an example, but um, maybe what you also need to do is um, give some language or give some terminology um, to common problems that people encounter that they might not realize that they have. Like, that's where I think something like coining a phrase might be really useful because you could be, you could be naming a certain pain point, naming a certain problem, and then hopefully, right, you can elegantly back that up into the solution that you provide. Um, the other side of that, it doesn't have to be so negative. It could just be naming a practice that people in this space do. Kind of back to the permissionless co-marketing thing I brought up earlier, which is not new thing, but a new phrasing for a practice that marketers are already doing. That makes sense. So for, for, for a thought experiment here that we're kind of going through this, <laughs> we, we can do product manager. We, let, let, let's actually start at a higher level and maybe let's assume out of this exercise, 
we know that we want to start creating content. So we're going to build like a media thing. It's just a content creation studio around startups maybe. And that's really what we want to focus on. And let's assume that we've niched down a tiny bit more through this process of just brainstorming, kind of doing this manually up, up until this point. So we're dealing with SaaS startups, tech startups in, um, in the health space, let's say. So let's let's say that that's kind of the, the niche down aspect that we've gotten to just manually, taking it a step further and starting to use data and in your research is a whole nother ordeal. So I know your default's gonna be Spark Toro, which is awesome. It's an awesome tool and everybody check it out. But I wanna, I wanna do some brainstorming too around other ways to kind of back up your initial brainstorming with data. So for you, are there any frameworks spark toro other tools like that come to mind for initial research to back up the brainstorming you've already done manually hmm. other tools so aside from spark toro i mean as a content creator my world tends to kind of be mostly in the social listening brand content kind of spaces so Aside from using, Sp so one, I would use Spark Toro to understand that audience's sources of influence and make like the podcast they listen to, magazines they read, websites they frequent, and then kind of incorporate that as part of my overall information diet. And that'll help me kind of speak their language and develop some fluency in the way that this audience thinks. So that is one piece of the puzzle. The other thing I would look at is I would look at some social listening tools in my niche. Um, I believe Brandwatch does this pretty well. Um, looking at like what's happening live, like, you know, live on Twitter, right? As, as conversations are happening, I would like to, I would keep a pulse on that and get a sense of certain trends, shared terminology, those sorts of things. Um, and then I also really like BuzzSumo as a tool or their content ideas generator tool. It's a great tool because it brings it, it brings forth trending topics and most linked to content. So there's at least some evidence behind the ideas that they're generating for you or like the ideas that they're suggesting for you. It's sort of like, you know, in the space of like healthcare, maybe it'll show you like the top, I think, four or five trending articles from that given week or so. And then it'll show you some 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 data on keyword uh, keyword search volume. So you can kind of pair that with, are people actually looking for this stuff? Um, that gives you some nice data behind that. And then of course, you know, using a tool like Ahrefs, right, on overall keyword volume, keyword difficulty to get a sense of, one, are people looking for this type of content? And two, can I realistically rank for it? So that's so, those are sort of all the, the pieces that I would be thinking about. Yeah, all, all great tools and there's also obviously a fine line between over researching this stuff and just going out and, and figuring it out. Right. So there, I mean, I'm sure that you would also probably recommend at some point, just go act on something, validate it, figure it out. But it's nice to have that, that little backbone of initial research, some tools to, to lay your hat on a little bit. you had brought up an example earlier of the cooking blog where it was maybe just miss audienced. I, I don't know how you would say that, but yeah, there's just a misalignment from their expectation based on one action. But then in the future, it just didn't keep, it wasn't repeatable. Are there on the flip side of that data points, maybe that you look at, whether it's in SparkTor or whatever, just indicators that like, oh yeah, this is the right audience. Oh, you know, I, I always kind of just feel like if the content is working, as in if people are reading it, Whatever, like if they're reading it and they're enjoying it, that's the right audience, whoever that is. <laughs> that's just sort of how I feel. Um, I love what you said earlier, though, about um, about potentially over researching something because I think you're so right. <laughs> Sometimes we get into this sort of we we put ourselves into this sort of analysis paralysis situation where we're like, I need more data to make a decision so I can make the thing. Because I also think that a big maybe the bigger part of it is actually creating great content. Like that's really, really hard to do. Um, that's why there are people like me who've spent like 10 years trying to create good content. <laughs> um, Same. But <laughs> my right, content it's, it's, really was bad. <laughs> <laughs> all of ours is, right? I, I look at my own content from last year and I'm like, 
Ugh, people like that. Yikes. <laughs> um, but the only way around that is to just keep creating, right? It's like the whole Ira Glass taste gap situation, right? There's a gap between what you want your content to look like, like the, the vision that you have for it, and then what you're actually capable of doing. And the only way to close that gap is to just keep creating and keep going forward. Um, so I would just kind of um, also, you know, emphasize that the importance of creating, honing that skill and getting better at content creation. Have you noticed any patterns for yourself and your own content where you've been able to draw that line? Like any, any patterns where you just say, okay, screw it. This is good enough. Let's launch. Yeah. I, I, I've been getting better about saying, you know what, let's just launch. Like that's it. I think it helps to have some forcing functions like dates that at which you always publish like my personal newsletter it's every other sunday that is just the format that i chose so meaning like on a certain sunday afternoon every other week i'm like oh i gotta do the thing it has to happen because that's what i decided and i, I know that like i know that there's no one out there who's gonna be like actually it's been 21 days since your last newsletter and i didn't sign up for it you know that's not gonna happen um no one cares but I care, right? And I think giving yourself that forcing function of I had to, I have to publish on this date, that's the agreement I made with myself. That kind of helps you get over it. Helps you just hit the publish button, move on to the next thing, and you just kind of over time figure out how to get better at it. I totally agree with this mentality. I was an overthinker for a very long time, and that is why I spent eight or nine years totally sucking at all social media <laughs> and when I finally just started trying to learn and uh, put everything out there, it, it ended up a lot better, even though it was a little bit harder up front. But that, that kind of transitioned in, into this idea of validating your audience and validating your ideas. And you had mentioned before something I really liked, which is the way the, the easiest way to tell if you pick the right audience is that your content works. I totally agree with that. Do you have any indicators of what that means for you? Like what does content working mean? Is it shareability? Is it engagement backlinks? What are you really looking at to validate yeah. your, your audience and idea? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this um, because there isn't just one thing that I look for. It's a bunch of clues because they're all kind of like breadcrumbs into figuring out if something is working. So um, things I look at on social media would be likes, retweets, comments, those sorts of things. Um, looking for, I mean, one, if something gets a ton of likes, that's, a, that's a, a pretty clear indicator of like, great, people like this thing. But looking at the comments too about like, if people are asking interesting follow-up questions, kind of basically like these comments that I'm seeing, are these conversations that I want to be having? So it's a little bit of that where it's, you know, it can involve like, Sure, maybe some people saying nice things. That's always nice, right? But then maybe people have interesting follow-up questions. They have additional ideas to add on to what you're saying. Like that's, I, I look for that stuff. So I look for dialogue. Um, I also look for, and, and sometimes um, instead of public in encounters, sometimes people will DM me and say like, hey, I saw this thread that you did. Really appreciate that insight for this reason. I pay attention to that. Um, I also look at things like, um, at like newsletter engagement, right? So there's open rates. Um, if people reply to the e to a prompt that I have in an email, or if they ask a question about something, I look at those things. And typically in a newsletter, right, newsletter engagement in terms of replies is a lot lower compared to top of funnel channels. So if I send out a newsletter to a few thousand people and I get two replies, that to me is a big success because most people don't reply to stuff. So paying attention to that. Um, I also try to look at what gets shared off platform because I think that's an interesting indicator that your idea resonated with someone and that it stayed with them. And by off platform, it could just be something like a tweet that was screenshotted and then posted to Instagram or LinkedIn. Or it's someone telling me like in an interaction, like, hey, my, my boss and I talked about your blog post. Um, Something like that means a lot to me. Like that to me is a much greater indicator of like, I will take that over 20 likes on Twitter any day, right? <laughs> um, 
I, I, I pay attention to stuff like that. So these are all pretty qualitative things, um, but they help give me clues that things are working. Um, oh, the last thing I would add to this is if it begets additional content. So if I if I do a slide, uh, a webinar, or like some kind of presentation that then becomes a blog post, that in of itself is a win to me because it kind of passed my bar or my standard for this is novel enough, this is interesting enough, this is valuable enough to become a codified blog post that lives on our website. I love it. That that kind of, I, I just had this thought pop into my mind too, that um, when we're doing audience research, we focus a lot on where they at right now, but good content creators, I'm, I'm sure you think about this pretty often, are thinking about where do I want my audience to be a year from now because of me or what can I contribute, right? And so when you're when you're adding that element into your research or maybe, I, I don't know, do you? Do you think about here's here's some outcomes I would like for my general audience member? How do you think about reconducting audience research a year later to see where you're actually at after you've committed to creating content? Or I, I, maybe this is too big of a question, but I'm curious how you think down the road about audience research. I love that framing. That wh- how, where, where, what was it? Where do I want my audience to be like a year from now or mm-hmm. whatever it is as a result of what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. I love that. So I haven't thought of that specifically, but it, it it is like the next, it's the next level of what I usually think about. And the, the thing, the lower level thing that I usually think about is whenever I tweet something, you know, just post something publicly, I think about, do I want to have this conversation 10 minutes from now? Or, or what are the interactions I want to get from this? And there are times when, or there have been times where I've posted, you know, pretty bro hooks for the, for the sake of the algorithm. Like, here are the books that you need to read to change your life, things like that. I'm guilty of that. But I, in the recent several months, or maybe past year, I would say I have tried to shy away from those types of hooks because when I've done that, I've realized the interactions I'm getting are not really the interactions I want to have. So using this book example, like books to change your life, I meant it. Like I really did mean it because I did a thread of, I I think it was like seven or so books that were super impactful for me. Um, in my young adulthood and my actual adulthood. So it was very deeply meaningful. But then I started getting, and it was, but, but, but I think because of the oversimplified hook that was like, change your life, um, I started getting questions about like, how do I buy a book? Where can I order these books? Can you show me how to purchase a book online? And those are things that I was like, oh my goodness, I don't want to have these kinds of conversations. I don't want to be someone's Amazon help desk. And that was like, you know what? Maybe that's on me. And that's the way I phrased this thing. And sure, it's pretty cool that it got a few thousand likes, but at the at, to me, at the expense of getting questions like this that I don't want to answer. So that's, I think that's related to your question. Your question is much better. Was where, where do I want my audience to be? Um, maybe the ne- that that next level is like what I would want. What I would hope to see from this example of a book thread is stuff like people saying, hey, I read that book you recommended. Um, it changed the way it changed the way I do job interviews now. And I just landed an awesome job. Like, I would love to hear that. Or I would love to hear something like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't read a lot of uh, books from women authors for whatever reason. I just, they happen to not be my radar. You recommended the Cheryl Strayed book and it really was, um, it really opened up my eyes to, you know, various life struggles that people, especially women, face. Like things like like that would mean a lot to me. So maybe I just think about it or will be thinking about it like what are the conversations I want to have one year from now? And then hopefully it's stuff like helping to expand someone's horizons, helping them to make an improvement on their marketing strategy, or maybe helping them – to make the case to their own boss, their own CEO, whoever it is, on 
a marketing initiative they wanted to do. So that's what I'm hoping for. I think it's all important. Like you can have, it's easy to plan out a year ahead and say, oh, this is where I want my audience to be. You still have to act on that. And it's all of those details that you're filling in there that actually make it happen. So you can have a strategy all you want, but again, it's those micro interactions, the micro details that make that up. You, you had mentioned earlier, you were talking about novelty as one of those key indicators that something's worth pursuing. If you can find a really novel angle and you think that's valuable, pursue that. Within your audience research, that could, you know, trying to find that novelty is probably going to lead you down the rabbit hole of content competitor research at some point. Do you, do you look too much into your content competitors in your, in your research? Do you try to dissect what they're doing so you can totally go off on tangents or do you try to not look in the rear view mirror? What's your approach? Um, I like this question. Um, I'm sort of all over the place with this one because I do pay attention to what other people are doing who might share the audience. Well, one, I guess people who share an audience might not be content competitors per se, but maybe I would say like content competitors in the sense of like, if there are other content marketers who talk about content marketing or whatever, um, I do pay attention to what they're saying and what they're doing. Um, and I look at it as, the way I look at it through the lens of, oh, what could I say that's different That's different from this or that's additive to this idea versus like, you know, like, dang it, like they said this thing and like, why didn't it work when I did it? So I try to think about like, what can I do? What can I do that has like a different spin on this? Or what would be my approach to this? It's even better if I happen to disagree with something because then it becomes clear to me like, oh, I wouldn't do it this way. Um, so I'm actually excited by when I do disagree and excited in a not hateful way, right? Not in a, just in a like, oh, cool. Like I have I actually, I didn't realize I had conviction in this other way of doing something. So maybe I'm going to write about that and then just kind of chase down that idea sort of, sort of independently of that person, right? Um but I do think about this stuff a lot and I think it's, and I also just think it's helpful. Obviously it's helpful to learn from other people, right? Like I, I love seeing when other creators are experimenting with new formats, new ways of publishing things, new ways of releasing their, their digital products. Like I think it's just super cool to see. And I think it's interesting. Um, and always just, you know, if it's a friend, always excited to root for them, of course. Definitely. Well, yeah. One of the, I mean, one of the competitive advantages you can have too with, building an audience is finding ways to transition that into a true community, which is easier said than done. But that's a, that's a novel thing in itself. I really quickly would just like to hear your thoughts on what the difference is between an audience and a community and how you, how you think about that. Do you try to phase your audience into more of a community that's smaller or do you try to keep them more separate? How, how do you think about the differences between those two? I sort of think of an audience as fans so like people who might just be who ideally are rooting for you from afar and they can be inclusive of friends, family, community. Um, but then I think of community as here's where I want to have the day to day interactions, deeper conversations, um, lasting conversations with people. So um, I don't think about community and audience as being discreet to certain platforms. Like I don't think of it as like oh, a community has to be in my Slack channel. Like, it, it's not that. It's like, that's a part of it. Um, I just think about the community piece as the lasting, ongoing, um, back and forth interactions or dialogues. So that's sort of how I think about it. And when I think about the difference between audience building, for instance, and community building, the way I see it is audience building is basically increasing your top of funnel engagement or awareness and then community building I think is like the nurture piece so that could be the people who join your newsletter where they're reading your deeper thoughts on something and then maybe you can have some email dialogue or it's pulling someone into a community of like uh, a podcast like a pod I feel like a podcast is sort of a community right because people are listening to you talk with your friends and they kind of feel like they are listening to two friends talking, right? That's a, that's a little bit of a community to me. So I don't know. That's just how I think about those things. My final question for the day. And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to chat about what you're working on. But uh, I like to keep it vague. I, I want to see after all this, all this conversation that we've had, 
if there was anything left out, do you have any final thoughts about everything we've talked about today? I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I didn't cover enough on creating high quality content. And I feel like I spoke very abstractly about that. So maybe I would just like to say that for ongoing content creation, yes, like to get better at it, you have to just keep doing it. You have to just hold yourself accountable and, ma- and make it happen. Um, but then other ways that I would suggest really testing the quality of it is are you proud of the work that you've created? Like, do you think that this is good? It doesn't have to mean perfect. It doesn't have to mean like, oh, would I change anything about this? No, because it's perfect. It's about like, are these ideas you can hang your hat on that you really just feel like this was worth, it's worth dying on this hill for. Like that, that's also what I would want to encourage people to think about. Like, what are the ideas you want to fight for? And try to work towards that. And you can't really, if you, if you go down that route, even if it's not the perfect keyword for SEO that you're passionate about, even if it's not the perfect tactic or perfect launch method or whatever, if you go down that road more often than not, I think you're going to succeed just because you're going to stick with it more likely than not, which is probably the biggest indicator for content creators succeeding is have, how much time have you put in? Have you, have you just published a lot over time? That's probably the biggest thing that I've seen at least is sticking around, being committed to it and enjoying it. And if you're doing those things and sticking around, you're already 99% ahead of everybody else that started with a, probably a better idea than you, but just didn't want to execute for very long. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, the time has come to give you the stage. I would love to give you a chance to talk about anything you're working on, what content you're proud of right now and any parting words or advice you have for the audience, the floor is yours. Yeah. So I will say since, you know, we talked all about content creation and distribution, um, I would be remiss in not saying that I teach a content marketing course, uh, Content Marketing 201, so sort of an intermediate level content course. Um, You can find that on my personal site, amandanet.com. I also write a twice a month newsletter. I write two newsletters, actually. My personal newsletter, The Menu, goes out every other Sunday. And then the audience research newsletter by Spark Toro goes out every other Thursday. So definitely check those out. Hopefully they're in the show notes. Um, and then follow me on Twitter at Amanda Nat. And that's mostly what I got going. I mean, check out Spark Toro too, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you got Yeah, there's a lot going on. But uh, all right. Thanks, Amanda, again for coming on. Can't wait to have you back on the podcast in, in the future as well. There's a lot more to dive in here, but... I feel very informed about a lot of new things for audience research. So thanks for taking the time with us. Thank you, Blake. This was so much fun. 